All right, here we are for uh, our second part of this video covering chapter four, which is on graphs of data. How do you display graphically data? And this today, uh, this video at least, we're going to focus on graphs of quantitative variables. Get, um, and I'm going to be using the pen a little bit. I'm going to take some breaks and take some notes on a separate um, slides here, and then also kind of watch my my mouse here a lot when I point out things. So there's four different types of graphs we're going to take a look at, and the uh, first one to take a look at is a frequency distribution and a histogram, probably the most famous. The most common display of quantitative data are frequency distributions and histograms. Very, very, very common. Um, here's the example we're going to use to kind of give us a feel for this first problem. To determine road usage in a small community, the um, NHTSA, which is basically the Highway Transportation um, Agency, anyway, randomly selected 70 households and asked for the number of vehicles owned by each household. The frequency table and histograms are given, um, and we are going to create a relative frequency distribution and a relative frequency histogram, so you guys can see what we mean by this. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to collect our data here. So remember, um, we have, um, there were five different options when we asked people, nobody had um, nobody of the 70 people at least had five or more cars. So we either got responses of 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4. So again, the response that we got was a number, which makes it quantitative. The, the What I got from each person was a number as opposed to a word. Um, three people had no cars, 10 had one, 38 households had two cars, 18 had three cars, and one had four cars. So we can make what we call a histogram of this. And the histogram is very simple. Looks and smells a lot like a bar graph, but it's not a bar graph. It's called a histogram or a frequency distribution. It just shows how the data was distributed. So on the bottom, since we're dealing with numbers, the x-axis is your options. What could people potentially say in order, 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4. You can't just put that whatever word order you want. And then up on the left-hand side here, the uh, vertical axis or the y-axis is the number of households, the actual options we had. And we had 3, 10, 38, 18, and 1. So notice 0 was down here at 3, 1 was up here at 10, 2 at 38, 3 at 18, and 4 at 1. So notice that um, there are the boxes are all the same width, and that's really, really important, and they're all touching each other, which is different than a bar graph. So make sure you realize the characteristics of this histogram, and it's a nice little, um, doesn't uh, looks like a bar chart, but it's not. Um, it's called a histogram that shows. We could also it's called a relative histogram. In a relative histogram, we figure out the relative frequency, which is just the percentages. So remember, there were 70 total people, and we said three of them had zero cars. So three out of 70 is about 4%. 10 out of 70 had one car, it's about 14%. 38 out of 70, which is about 54%, had two cars. 18 out of 70, 25% had three cars. And one out of 70, which is about 1.4%, had four cars. And again, you still have your options. What were the different possibilities people could say on the bottom, 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4? And up on the left hand, instead of having total counts, which we call frequency, we have the percentage. And we could have went 0 to 100, but nobody was even close to 100%. 2 at 54%, so we thought going up to 60% made sense. And then again, let's just pick out the bar here that represents 2, went up to about what we thought was 54%. Notice how they're all still connected, and the other key thing is notice how the two graphs, there's the frequency, there's the relative frequency, they look exactly the same. That's pretty much exactly what's going to happen because it's representing the same set of data, just looking at it percentage-wise versus totals. So um, the last example was for what we call a discrete variable. So I want to take a quick second here and um, define what a discrete variable is, because this is a pretty important word. Um, a discrete variable, I'm not adding a different variable. A discrete variable is a form of a quantitative variable. Okay, so it's just a different form. There's no such thing as a discrete categorical variable. And the, um, the thing with a discrete variable is you're, you only have a limited number of options or a limited number of outcomes. Or another way of saying is your outcomes can be listed. All outcomes could be listed, meaning every possible outcome could be listed. So, for example, how many cars do you have? Well, it could be zero, you know, one, two, three, four. I guess some people out there could have 10 cars or maybe some rich, famous athlete has 20 cars. Or if you're like me, maybe you have 32 cars. Um, 
But the point is, I could list them all. Um, it's impossible to have 1.3 cars, or you could never have 3.4625 cars, or 32 to tenths car. That's impossible. So that's why we these are discrete, because they're integers, they're whole numbers, and you can actually list all of the different outcomes that you have. So looking back to our example, like we said, we had 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4. That's what makes it discrete. Um, Notice that the two tables were very similar, and we have a question here that says, what is the difference between a bar graph and a histogram? Uh, lots of differences. Bar graph is for categorical, histogram is for quantitative. Bar graphs, the bars do not touch each other. With the histogram, they do. They're squished up next to each other. Uh, bar graph, on the bottom, you got the words, male, female, female uh, what state, or, you know, something like that, or... Um, what are some other examples we've done? You know, what's your favorite movie? You can have Batman down there. You can have uh, the Bourne movie down there. You could have um, Hot Shots, great movie from the 80s, 90s. I don't remember, something like that. But anyway, that's what you do. Histogram, you got numbers, 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 numbers. All right, so um, moving on here, let's look at another example. Okay, the following data are the caloric content of McDonald's Happy Meals. So we looked at 24 different Happy Meals, and we got the caloric um, content of those Happy Meals. So we want to create a frequency distribution histogram of this. But I want to take a quick stop right here. These are continuous data. It's continuous. So let's go back to our notes here. We talked about discrete variables. Again, you could list all outcomes. And I guess I should have wrote the word list all outcomes. Uh, we also have what's called a continuous. Uh, variable. And this is again still quantitative. Okay, this isn't categorical thing like that. And continuous means that you can't list them all, or at least it would take an extremely long time. Um, an example for this would be like um, if I ask somebody, "What do you weigh?" I mean, if you want to get real specific, I couldn't possibly list the weight of every single person in the world. Um, because, you know, if somebody says, well, I could weigh 122 or 123, well, what about 122.2 pounds? That's a possibility. I couldn't have 1.2 cars up here. That's why that was discrete. Down here, I could weigh 122.25 pounds. I could weigh 122.25262738 pounds. I mean, there's so many options. So just between these two simple weights, there is a continuous or an unlistable amount of outcomes. So same thing with this content or this caloric content that we're talking about here. How many calories? I couldn't possibly list all the calories. I know these are all whole numbers, but boy, can you imagine trying to make a list of all the different amounts of calories you could have? Anywhere from zero to, I don't know, some big huge cheeseburger that has thousands upon thousands of calories. You couldn't list them all, so we call that continuous. So when we have a continuous um, variable, how we make the distributions and how we make the histograms is a little bit different. We have what we call bins or classes. Okay, So we have a class or a bin, and it's probably better if I show you first, and then we'll come back and talk about these um, kind of words here. Here's the histogram right here that we're talking about. So kind of follow my mouse down here. Notice that we have bins. The first bin is for any sandwich or any Happy Meal that was from 300 to 350, and then we went 350 to 400. Then 400 to 450. Obviously, the bins have to be equal size. We chose to go by 50s here. And then you simply list all of your different bins. So the and we call bins left-handed bins. So again, 350 to 399, meaning you include the left and you go all the way up until the right. So this bin right here technically would be 350 to 399.999999. And then you simply count how many Happy Meals, remember we had 24 Happy Meals, how many of them fell in that bin? Well, there were three Happy Meals that fell in that bin. Next bin is 400 to 449, or I'm looking at the graph, 400 to 450. Two fell in that bin. And then you just count up how many fell in each bin, as opposed to the previous example where there's only five outcomes, 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4, and you just put them in each outcome bar. Here, it's about creating these bins, and this is what you do with continuous variables. And you have a histogram on the frequency there is how many fell into each bin. And you can make the bins whatever size you want. We could have done hundreds, you know, 350 to 450, 450 to 550. But if you have too few bins, and it kind of, they get all squished, and they're all real tall, or it kind of looks pancaked. I mean, they're all about the same size. If you have too many bins, 
then it, they're all real small. You know, I think if we went by twos, then they'd be real tiny. A lot of bins would be empty, and every now and then there'd be a bin, and it would look pretty crappy. So how many bins do you need? I don't know. No one really knows for sure. There's no set amount. You just want it to look fairly nice, okay? And usually when you're working with Excel, you could um, mess around with that a little bit. So when we talk about the lower class limit, the upper class limit, and so forth, all we're talking about is the lower end would be 350 and the upper end would be 400. We usually like to call that left-handed bins because we include the left and we don't include the right. We could also do a relative frequency chart. Same thing. How many fell in this bin? Three out of the 24 is the 12.5%. And that's where we got that value from. Two out of the 24 was 8.3%. And then you could, instead of having your bins go up to the number of, they would go up to the relative frequency or the percentage. So hopefully that makes a lot of sense. Um, here's a couple notes. Um, you can use Excel to make these. It's pretty easy. We'll take a, spend a little bit of time. Most of you guys are probably better at that than me. Um, if you have too many bins, too many classes, it could look pancaked. Okay, um, because there, there, there's just too many. It looks kind of crappy, you know what I mean? If there's too few, we kind of get this skyscraper look where there's, you know, one or two bins hold all the data, and all of a sudden that's a real tall bin, and it, it looks misleading. So be careful with that. So hopefully histograms make sense. We're going to spend a lot of time in class working on them. The next type of graph is stem and leaf plots. I'm sure everybody has seen one of these stem and leaf plots. So here's one that we made with the uh, McDonald's Happy Meal data. So we start off with the um, first number here. And what we did was we rounded everything to the nearest, um, let's see, hundreds, tens, right? So the, here's the, you know, it's always nice to have one of these little keys so you understand what it says. So a three on the left and a six on the right means 360. So right here would be 360, 370, 370, 430, 440, 460. You catch my drift. Um, you could set up in several different ways. This is one of the most common ways to do it. And um, the neat thing about this is if you tilt your head to the right, so your chin's on the, to the left and your top, your head's to the right. You kind of look, you kind of see what a histogram is. You know what I mean? It almost looks like a histogram with these bars going up. Um, so the numbers at the left are the stems. The numbers on the right are the leaves. And leaves are arranged in increasing order. Notice how these always go in order. 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 2, 7, 8, 9. They always go in order. So keep that in mind when you make one of these. And again, how you set up the key is up to you. If you have decimal points, you can do this could possibly mean 3.6. This could mean 36. This could mean, heck, it could mean 0.36. It could even mean... 36 thousands, whatever you want to give in the key. So having in that key is pretty important there as well. Um, next up, we have dot plots. Dot plots are uh, pretty boring, but they're really easy to understand. Basically, you use it for mostly for discrete data. It's a little bit easier to make them for discrete data. So we have the number of cars per household, 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4. And you just put little dots for how many. How many how many households had zero? Well, three. So we had three dots there. How many had one? Well, I can't remember. I think it was 10 dots, something like that. Two, I think it was 18 dots. Can't remember exactly. No, it's probably more than 18 dots, looks like. But anyway, um, you just create little dots for your tally marks. And again, when you sit back and look at it, it kind of looks like a histogram in the sense that you got these rows of dots or columns of dots that look like the bars from the histogram. So it's just another way to do it. We usually do not do... Um, dot plots with um, continuous variables. I mean, you kind of can, you just got to be real careful. Um, but it's a lot easier if you do it with something that you could clearly list the possible outcomes of the um, data. Um, here's a couple different shapes. When we're talking about creating these histograms, one of the most important things to talk about the histogram is the shape of it. And here's a shape where we call this first one here uniform. Notice how all the bars are about the same height. They don't have to always be exactly the same like this example, but if they're pretty close to the same, we call that uniform, meaning all the bins are the same throughout. We have one that we call bell-shaped. Another word for this is mound-shaped or even symmetric. Think if you put a line right down the middle, the left would fold onto the right, and we call it symmetric. So bell-shaped, mound-shaped, symmetric are what we call this, where we got a lot of the data in the middle, very few on the left, very few on the right. We also have what's called skewed left and skewed right. This is when the data starts off small and then gets bigger over here, or starts off with a lot of data and then slowly gets less. So you're always skewed towards the tail. So if you kind of see what I mean by a tail, 
think of the side that's getting smaller as the tail. So if the tail's on the left, we're skewed left. Over here, if the tail of the data, where the data is the smallest, is on the right, it's skewed to the right. A bell-shaped almost has a tail on each side. That's why we call it bell-shaped or mound-shaped, meaning if you dumped a mound of dirt down, it'd kind of fall like that. So left skewed or skewed left, skewed right. We also call this skewed positive or skewed negative, skewed towards the smaller numbers, negative, skewed towards the bigger numbers, the positives. Um, there's also a couple other ones we want to take a look at. We're not going to spend a lot of time on these because I really got to show you these in class. Um, I'm going to skip this frequency polygram here, here for a second. We're going to talk about what's called a cumulative frequency charts or OGIs. And this is where we talk about built up. Cumulative means built up frequency. So we want to build up the totals. So here's a really easy way of showing this. We're going to do one of these in class together, but I want you guys to see this. Here's our data again from the Happy Meals. So we have our bins, same bins as before, and we had how many fell into each bin. We did the percentages of the total. So now here's the cumulative part. Here's where we build up. So cumulate. In the 353.99, there were three bins. The next one is everything in that bin or less. So that's why it'd be the 2 plus the 3 making the 5. So for this bin, cumulating would be how many fell into that bin or less. So it's the 3, 2, and the 3, which makes the 8. How many in this bin or less? That's the 6, the 3, the 2, the 3, that's the 14. How many in this bin? Well, that's the 3, the 6, the 3, the 2, the 3, that's the 17. And all the way to the very end, where basically the last um, cumulative frequency should be your total, how many you have, because it's that bin or everything less, which would be the 24 or the total. And then next to that, we have the cumulative relative frequency, which is the built up percentage. So once again, the first one starts out at 12.5% of the data, 3 out of 24. And the next one would be the 0.83 plus the 1.125. So it would be the 8.3% plus the 12.5% giving me 20.8%. So it's the built up. It's that bin and anything underneath it. Same thing with this one now. We're in the third bin here, the 450 to 499. So you take the point one. 125 added up with the point 083 added up with the other point 125. So that's how you build the accumulative relative frequency. And that very last bin should have the thousand or not not a thousand the 100 percent because it's how much data is in that bin or underneath it. Well, if it's the last bin, all the data should be. So that's what we call cumulative frequency chart or an ogive. And then we can actually make a picture of the ogive. Um, right here. So I know I skipped the slide there, but we'll come back to it, or we don't really necessarily need to. The OGIVE shows that built up percent. So you'd say at 399, we were at the 12.5 percent. And then in this next bin, what percentage were we at? I think we built up to 20.8 percent. And then the third bin, we built up to 33.3 percent. So it shows how you got built up. And this, um, these graphs are really important to understand, and we're going to look at one in class and really talk about it because, you know, the video alone, I can't do it a whole lot of justice, but it's important to understand how these graphs show the built up as we go on. We will make one of those on our own as well. And the last one we want to show is a time series plot, and a time series plot simply has X axis is the time. So it shows how data collected has changed over time. That's pretty obvious. If you see time on the X axis, it's a time series plot. So this one right here, here shows how the population has changed over time. So we got time on the bottom. We got at each year what was the population. It shows how it was built up. So um, that's pretty easy to recognize. Most kids have no issues with a time series plot there as well. So hopefully that all makes sense. There'll be a couple other things we'll kind of talk about here and there in class, um, especially things that are. Um, no, we won't even get to that. We'll end with just a time series plot and be good for the day here. And um, have fun and talk to you guys when I see you in class.